many of America's children are disappearing. According to the Office of Juvenile Justice, a child goes missing every 40 seconds in the United States. While many of these children are recovered, it is estimated that more than 58,000 of them are abducted by non-family members each year. Parents are continually in fear for their child's safety, even in front of their own home. Predators seem to roam the streets of America like never before, searching for prey to carry out their unthinkable desires. Many of our laws are named after raped and murdered children, whose memories echo through our courts crying for justice. But still, the problem only seems to get worse. And we also see in a lot of these kidnapping and death cases recently by sex offenders that your child can be lost in just an instant. The faces of children who have been lost continue to haunt us as a society, while watching their parents grieve has become part of a national nightmare. Meanwhile, the images of the sex offenders, the men responsible for these horrors, fills us with fear and loathing. And if a child survives their abuse, they often lead troubled lives, haunted by the memory of what they've endured. It is awful. Those kids shouldn't be subjected to this. That's awful. It scars them psychologically forever. It affects their lives. Well, some of the experts say that once a pedophile, always a pedophile, that recidivism is 80 or 90 percent, if not more. The United States of America has basically become a pedophile's playground. Uh, Jessica Lensford's father, he had said, uh, he said, you know, wake up, America. Your child could be next. And sadly, a lot of people want to turn away from the evidence. They want to turn their heads like the proverbial ostrich with its head in the sand because they don't want to face what's going on until they're forced to face it because it becomes their child. Part of the confusion is over why many of our judges send repeat sex offenders back into our neighborhoods, knowing it is simply a matter of time before they strike again. Can the reason be that these same judges are compromised by their own sexual addiction? We know that the judges are like, they're human, they're like everybody else. Cases of judges who are compromised by porn are documented across the country. But the license for such behavior may have been issued in 1970, when Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas and retired Justice Arthur Goldberg wrote articles for Playboy magazine. But why would an association with a soft porn magazine like Playboy be cause for concern? And how could it pertain to the world of pedophiles? The disturbing answer to this question, as our history of this movement unfolds. In 1990, the American Bar Association reported that 80% of convicted child molesters plea bargain and serve no prison time. This statistic undoubtedly put known pedophiles back on the streets in record numbers. But this was a few years prior to the widespread use of the Internet, where the most extreme forms of sexual perversion, and especially child pornography, have become a major factor in conditioning the next generation of sexual predators. In 2006, the law firm of Este and Bomberger reported that the number of victims of childhood sexual abuse and molestation grows each year. This horrific crime is directly tied to the growth of pornography on the Internet. They went on to say that research reveals that 77% of child molesters of boys and 87% of child molesters of girls admitted imitating the sexual behavior they had seen in pornography they had watched. Basically, people that watch porn act it out. And so with the pedophilia, um, Sure, people are going to see it and they're going to act it out. Uh, because of the huge impact that the porn industry has had, um, conservative estimates say service, the highest service revenue on the Internet, uh, over $3 billion a year in income just on Internet porn. Uh, and those are very conservative figures. I'm sure they're much higher with between 500 and 700 new sites coming on a day on the Internet. The increase in child sexual abuse cannot be denied. 
We are massacring our children. It is a holocaust against our children. I've prosecuted murders. I've prosecuted child molesters. And I'll tell you, I get more up in the air when I was prosecuting about the child molester than the murder. I'm not condoning murder. It's not the right thing to do, but it's over. The person's gone sad. But that poor little boy or girl, they're messed up for life. I mean, they're going to be carrying that baggage forever. And we as a society better start addressing that. Researchers argue that America's current problem with sexual predators is the fallout from the sexual revolution, a movement said to be inspired by the late Alfred Kinsey and his famous Kinsey Reports, first published in 1948. According to the conservative organization Human Events, the Kinsey Report is listed among the top 10 most harmful books of the 19th and 20th centuries. Number one on their list was the Communist Manifesto that inspired the deaths of more than a hundred million people in the 20th century alone. Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf that helped to bring about the Holocaust was listed at number two. While the quotations from Chairman Mao who founded Communist China was number three. At number four as the first American title on the list was the Kinsey Reports. Sexual behavior in the human male followed by sexual behavior in the human female, which when first released was likened to dropping an atom bomb on American society. In 1989, a report from the National Research Council published a statement that American society can be divided into two categories, the pre-Kinsey and post-Kinsey eras. How could one man's influence come to define our culture and produce what some consider the most harmful book in American history. It would find its way into every aspect of our decision making in our lives. Dr. Judith Reisman is renowned for her expertise on the damaging influence of pornography. She has testified repeatedly before the U.S. Congress. Her research has been used by the FBI and by governments throughout the Western world when determining their policies on obscenity. She is author of the book, Kinsey, Crimes and Consequences, in which she details the devastating impact of Alfred Kinsey in America, an influence she believes is behind the growing number of sexual predators who seem to come from all walks of life. Teachers, doctors, lawyers, judges, uh, people are being caught right and left. Uh, sacrificing their lives and their families' lives to their addictions to child pornography. How do you think it happened? It did not start today. It started back, back with Kinsey, and who then kicked off what has become today's, uh, today's horror show. Child sexual abuse, rape, torture, People say, well, you can't track that all to Kinsey. Well, you can track enough of it to make an awfully frightening case. While Dr. Reisman's view may seem extreme, her evidence is disturbing, the results of which are so often reported in our nightly news. 35-year-old convicted sex offender Bradley Meinhardt was sentenced to just one to three years in prison for sexually assaulting a 12-year-old girl in East Penn and a guy at a prior. Here's the suspect right here, Joseph Edward Duncan. He has a long history of sexual aggression. Here's Larry Don McQuaid, the 41-year-old former school bus driver who's confessed to sexually abusing more than 200 children. I was able to manipulate parents and children alike that I was such a nice guy that I wouldn't do something as wrong and disgusting and uh, is that I consider myself a demon. It's too dangerous for me to be on the street. I'm Should he be released? Uh, we tried to protest parole. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, the statute requires his release. I didn't know that the average sex offender uh, predator uh, molests a hundred children. I mean, that just makes my outrage even more. For years, Americans have wondered why repeat sex offenders so often receive light prison sentences only to be released back into society. According to Dr. Reisman, the answer is Alfred Kinsey. The laws were changed based upon his fraudulent data and he was directly involved in those changes. Kinsey went state by state, I have his testimony in California in 1949, telling a committee that was about to toughen the sex laws and, and toughen up about the laws to protect children, 
because there had been a murder of two little girls, he goes to California to testify in 1949 that you should release everybody, that, that pedophiles and pederasts did not repeat their crimes, that parole was absolutely critical, that would reduce our sex crimes. The committee believes him. They reduce all of our sex crimes. They parole people, and they haven't stopped. When the Kinsey Report was first released, the famous ACLU lawyer, Morris Ernst, wrote that virtually every page of the Kinsey Report touches on the legal code. He told the legal profession that no bar association, law school journal, or lawyer's committee can consider sex laws without the Kinsey study. According to Westlaw, the most widely used legal database, between the years 1982 to 2000, there were approximately 650 citations to Alfred Kinsey. The model penal code that was adopted uh, just after 1955 was based on Kinsey's research. This is a flow chart I put together to describe how the Kinsey research gutted American laws. Through the American Law Institute, ALI, the American Law Institute model penal code, 1955, that was where protections were then removed for women and children from American law system. The U.S. justice system from 1948 to today, that's what this is about. After publishing his reports, Kinsey traveled the country, giving lectures at universities and testifying before lawmakers. He was received as the leading scientific expert in the world on human sexuality. In particular, he discussed laws concerning sex offenders and the education of children. Of children, he said, 100% of or are orgasmic from birth. Therefore, children can benefit from sex with adults and even incest, so that we, which is illegal. So we need to lower the age of consent. Uh, that's he was working toward making everything legal, but that's all right. Children need early, explicit sex, school sex education since they're sexual from birth, which was illegal at the time. Now it's everywhere. They need masturbation and hetero and homosexual acts to be taught to them, which was illegal, and now it's being taught. And about parole, Kinsey said that sex offenders rarely repeat sex crimes. Therefore, all sex offenders should be paroled, which is exactly what, then what started to take place. Part of Kinsey's defense of pedophiles was that children were not really harmed by sexual contact with adults. Therefore, it made no sense to incarcerate pedophiles for lengthy prison terms. 1950, uh, Rockefeller funded the American Law Institute Model Penal Code. 1952, a Harvard Law Review called for a code to change our sex laws in accordance with what Kinsey had objectively found. And then in 1955, the code was created and sent out to all legislators in the country via these important people, judge, lawyers, sociologists, lawyers, and so forth. And from there, that went the ALI model, the, the sex offenses section, sent to states all over the country, adopted all or in part beginning in 1956 here and moving on to Illinois, to Minnesota and so forth, and all other states of the Union. As Dr. Reisman noted, the model penal code was financed by the Rockefeller Foundation. Not coincidentally, the Rockefeller Foundation also financed the research of Alfred Kinsey. In the 1950s, a congressional committee was formed under Congressman B. Carroll Reese to investigate the influence of the large tax-exempt foundations, including Rockefeller. There was a huge concern at the time, in the 1950s, that uh, the foundations were now being run by people with a strikingly strident a libertarian or liberal agenda which resisted and resented the Judeo-Christian way of life. The late Norman Dodd was the director of research for the Reese Committee. In an interview recorded shortly before his death, Dodd stated that part of what the committee had learned was that the objective of the great foundations was to remove America from the values on which she was built and to do so through the education system. What we had uncovered was the determination of these large endowed foundations, this Carnegie Endowment story and the Ford Foundation and the Guggenheim and the Rockefeller Foundation, all working in harmony toward the control of education in the United States. 
Dodd's testimony becomes an important issue when considering the direct impact of Kinsey's research on sex education in America. While the Reese Committee investigated many programs funded by the foundations, when it came to Kinsey's research, they were vehemently opposed by the late Congressman Wayne Hayes. Uh, that's established quite well in Renee Wormser's book on foundations, the power, their power and influence, a book that no American who wants to understand what happened to our country should be without. Renee Wormser was the lawyer for the Reese Committee. In his book, Wormser writes that the committee had dug up some significant material about foundation support of the Kinsey projects. This brought Mr. Hayes into a steaming rage, he says, and he asked to see our entire Kinsey file. It was produced for him, and he angrily declared to Mr. Dodd that we were to go no further with this particular investigation, contending that every member of Congress would be against our doing so. Mr. Hayes stated emphatically to Mr. Dodd that he would oppose any further appropriation to our committee unless the Kinsey investigation were dropped. Wormser writes that as a result, the valuable material in our Kinsey file never saw the light of day. What was it in the Kinsey file that provoked such a response from a U.S. congressman? As we move forward, consider that the Kinsey data was partly paid for by the American taxpayers, who continue to fund the Kinsey Institute to this day. There's more going on in that institute. They have covered up so much. Some believe that if Kinsey's research had been exposed in the 1950s, the information might have sparked a second American Revolution. What was in the Kinsey file, and does that information continue to influence, or even haunt, America? Through the 1930s and 40s, Alfred Kinsey conducted thousands of interviews with both men and women, taking, as he called it, their sexual histories. The purpose of his study was to discover the sexual behavior of the average man and woman in America at the time. Kinsey was a professor at the University of Indiana in Bloomington. Despite his Christian upbringing, he would come to reject the Judeo-Christian belief of his family in favor of Darwinian philosophy, accepting the idea that man is simply a more highly evolved animal. Kinsey, as a zoologist and biologist, considered, rightly, that humans are animals, although lots of people hate to admit that. Kinsey's expertise had been the study of the gall wasp. He spent years collecting and cataloging thousands of them. Noticing the countless differences in these insects, he concluded that such variations must also be true of human behavior. Upon interviewing thousands of volunteer subjects, Kinsey not only recorded data, but drew certain conclusions about the sexual behavior of men, women, and children. But was his research that of an objective scientist or the intentional manipulation of a sexual deviant who wanted to remake the American male and female in his own image. Kinsey uh, has legitimized uh, the free sex revolution um, and he did it through academia. But what's interesting according to uh, research that's been done on this gentleman uh, this guy was a pervert himself. Kinsey's critics claim that his real motive was not science, but a social agenda to change the morality of America, something admitted by Kinsey biographer Jonathan Gaythorne Hardy. It's abundantly clear that you go into it that there was a very large social agenda. He, he didn't just want a greater tolerance and sanity from understanding the facts of sex. He, was, he thought it was quite monstrous the way homosexuals were regarded. In general, there was a very powerful social agenda, which is perfectly plain when you read the book from the polemic right the way through it, and was perfectly plain at the time to the people who worked with him. 
When the Kinsey reports were published, they shocked the country because the behavior that Kinsey described did not at all represent what most Americans believed about their own sexuality. Consider that Kinsey was documenting the behavior of the World War II era. Those that Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation. Among Kinsey's more controversial claims is the idea that 10% of American men were fully homosexual for at least three years of their life, while 37% of American men had engaged in homosexual contact to the point of orgasm at least once in their lives. Later studies would place those numbers much lower, with only 1% of men in the U.S. claiming to be homosexual, while only 2-3% to admitted to some kind of homosexual activity in their lifetime. Nevertheless, Kinsey's data was seized upon by men like Harry Hay, who read the Kinsey reports, left his wife and children, and went on to found the gay rights revolution that began in the 1960s. To this day, the gay rights movement is largely based on Kinsey's data. Kinsey also reported high levels of premarital sex, claiming that 69% of American men had visited prostitutes and that 50% of married men were guilty of adultery. Again, a later study done as early as 1960 by Phyllis and Eberhard Kronhausen would find that the levels of sexual promiscuity among males were much lower than Kinsey had reported. According to his fellow researchers, the reason for this dramatic difference is because Kinsey manipulated the data, including men from America's prisons, as part of the regular male population. He wrote that he found 1,300 to 1,400 sex offenders that he used as his normal male population. What? In addition to the convicted sex offenders, Kinsey included regular prisoners who were serving time for other offenses, along with 199 sexual psychopaths, all mixed together as part of the regular male population and presented to the American people as the average American male. In this interview for the documentary titled One in Ten, listen as Paul Gephardt, who was one of Kinsey's co-authors and a member of his original team, admits to the high percentage of prisoners and their impact on Kinsey's data. With these uh, poorer, lower educational level samples. And when I say poor, poorer, they had, for example, 55% were prison. 55% were prison. And uh, I think that has, a, you know, that has a definite effect. We know uh, we didn't have enough non-prison people to do much of a comparison, but he didn't do a comparison. He he simply took the uh, the prison people he got and used them with that uh, you know less than college educated sample. But the trouble was by you might say emphasizing the less than college educated sample. He introduced a lot of errors into the data. With America's prison population presented as the average male, is it any wonder that laws would be changed to accommodate sexual predators while failing to protect women and children? To create high levels of homosexual activity, Kinsey also went into Chicago's underground into gay bars and homosexual bathhouses and incorporated the radically gay population into his regular male data. Along with bootleggers, gamblers, male prostitutes, ne'er-do-wells, pimps, thieves and hold-up men, all this according to his own report. Kinsey used similar tactics to redefine the average American female. Uh, they use this picture all the time to try and show the American public that they were interviewing uh, average American women, all right? Except that this was their secretary, okay? This is a secretary at the Kinsey Institute, and they would always label her as though she was just some average American woman. Sometimes they put Kinsey in the picture interviewing her, and sometimes they put him. 
And now, after I exposed that in one of my books, the Kinsey Institute has now admitted on its, on its website, you know, they, they give the name of her so it doesn't look as though they're trying to phony the thing. To create high levels of female promiscuity among American wives, Kinsey redefined married women to include any woman that had lived with a man for at least a year, a broad description that could include prostitutes who had lived with their pimps. In fact, prostitutes were a subculture that Kinsey specifically sought out, mixing them in with the regular female population. As a result, Kinsey's report stated that some 50% of American women engaged in premarital sex, while 26% of married women were supposedly involved in adultery. Kinsey went on to report that an incredible 87% of unmarried women were having abortions, while 25% of married wives were also aborting. It was these high percentages, shocking even by today's standards, that would help to legalize abortion in the years that would follow. For decades, Dr. Judith Reisman has argued against what is often referred to as Kinsey's junk science because of its dramatic and devastating impact on American law and society. Corrections starts to enact all of this into corrections decisions in the legal profession in law schools. Now Kinsey would be taught as part of the legal structure via the American Law Institute Model Penal Code, that ferrets out into the private and public education, becomes our sex education, is in our American Law Review journals, it's found in parole through corrections, state and local, and criminal, civil, family, and juvenile justice, and expert witnesses then from the sex world begin to inform this whole structure. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have had a real dirty deal we have, as that FBI agent said to me, the head of, of, of the FBI Behavioral Science Unit, after he saw my work on Kinsey and on Playboy, he said to his sons, guys, we have been conned. Kinsey's willingness to work with the devil at one point seemed to take on a very literal meaning. One of the interesting things I found several years ago in researching the Satanist Aleister Crowley uh, was the influence that he has had on so many people here in the United States of America. And one of the man, men that he had influenced was Alfred Kinsey. After publishing his male and female reports, Kinsey began to travel abroad and study sexuality in foreign countries. In his book, Kinsey co-author Wardell Pomeroy wrote that Kinsey went looking for a prized item, the diaries of Aleister Crowley. Crowley died just a year before uh, Kinsey's book came out. Crowley was a famous and highly controversial British occultist in the early part of the 20th century. His sexual exploits in bizarre and sometimes deadly satanic rituals had been exposed in the London newspapers. He also talked about taking a virgin and having sexual relations with her and then upon a climax to actually murder her, cut her in six pieces and put the names of the various demon gods on those six limbs, those six parts of her body. Taking the name for the Antichrist in the Bible, Crowley called himself the Beast 666. His famous saying was, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, by which he justified all forms of immorality. Crowley had a sex temple and had practiced uh, group sex and orgies and what have you, so-called sex magic. Crowley was into pedophilia. He was into uh, justifying his pedophilia. In fact, he had said, let me seduce the boys of England. He wanted to seduce them, and he, then he starts talking about sodomy and it being, should be acceptable. So, uh, I mean, it was quite shocking, especially back then. Pomeroy wrote that Crowley was called by Lord Douglas the wickedest man who ever lived, and his sexual history alone was enough to earn him the title he gloried in, the Beast. Crowley kept a diary up to his death. Two weeks after Kinsey tracked down these papers in England, he found himself in the temple 
that the beast had found it in Sicily. Kinsey is pictured here inside Crowley's temple, known as the Abbey Philema, where he performed his satanic rituals. On the wall is a picture of Crowley himself, while across from Kinsey is another man named Kenneth Anger. Anger was a close acquaintance who appeared in some of Kinsey's sex films, made in the attic of his Bloomington home. As an avant-garde filmmaker, Anger was deeply involved in the occult. He directed films with titles such as Lucifer Rising and The Invocation of My Demon Brother. Kenneth Anger uh, is a co-founder of uh, Anton LaVey's Church of Satan, and Kenneth Anger uh, also was, you know, had a penchant for younger men, for sure. Bobby Beausoleil was his living boyfriend. That's the same Bobby Beausoleil that committed the first m murder, uh, killing him and for uh, Charles Manson. That was his living boyfriend. He played Lucifer in one of his uh, occult uh, movies that extolled the virtues of Aleister Crowley's magic and what have you. In this image from one of Anger's films, we see Bobby Beausoleil, who would later become one of Charles Manson's killers. He's standing next to a doorway with Crowley's maxim, do what thou wilt, painted on the door. A phrase that certainly fit with Kinsey's own view of human sexuality. Pomeroy even admits that, that Kinsey uh, loved uh, Crowley's writings, including uh, specifically mentioning some of his homosexual erotica, uh, one of his books called White Stains. Kenneth Anger is quoted saying that Kinsey was obsessed with obtaining the Great Beast's day-to-day sex diaries. To obtain grant monies and maintain the support of the university, Kinsey needed the excuse of research to validate his 24 hours a day obsession with sex. However, Kinsey's battle cry of do your best and let other people react as they will seemed a variation on Crowley's do what thou wilt maxim. An older Kenneth Anger is pictured here with the name Lucifer tattooed on his chest. So important was Anger's relationship with Kinsey that to this day, the Kinsey Institute Library features a Kenneth Anger collection with an archive of Anger's films as well as the correspondence between him and Alfred Kinsey. Should America be disturbed that the father of her sexual revolution who changed American law and laid the foundation for sex education had such associations? If America continues to be influenced by Kinsey, what will it mean for her future? What Kinsey discovered at Crowley's mysterious abbey might provide a clue. Pomeroy writes that Crowley's curious magnetism drew people from all over the world who came and became his sexual slaves. Some of these women left their husbands to enter the temple. They held group orgies as part of their ritual and included in them the small children the women had brought. He further reveals that inside the abbey, Kinsey found paintings, life-sized representations of sexual activity, including children. Some have considered the possibility that Aleister Crowley was another of Kinsey's pedophiles who kept his diaries as part of Kinsey's sex research. I would be surprised if Kinsey uh, was not, in fact, either paying or communicating with Crowley regarding his sex diaries, because Crowley was more open and more public with his sexual exploits than pretty much anybody of the time. He was known as the wickedest man on the earth long before uh, Kinsey would have gone to him. He was far more uh, accessible than, say, a Nazi officer in Germany uh, to Kinsey, and, and as, as ugly as Crowley was to so many people, uh, he wasn't nearly as known, or, or there wasn't the reputation that there was with the Nazis. And at the same time, Crowley uh, could have used the money in the 1940s. He had, uh, you know, he wasn't as rich as he was. He had spent a lot of his money, so he would have been more open to that. And then to see that Kinsey was actually reading Crowley's stuff, we know that from Pomeroy. And it would be hard to believe that he wasn't already working with Crowley and encouraging Crowley to continue on with his sexual exploits. One way or another, the, the net effect is the same. Kinsey was fostering much of the same revolution that Crowley had begun over in England. 
and was helping continue what Crowley hoped would take place in the United States of America. Mass media seems to have always been on the side of Kinsey and his philosophy. A philosophy carried out by Hugh Hefner in 1953 when he launched Playboy magazine. That same year, Kinsey released his K-Bomb, Sexual Behavior in the Human Female, the second book in his report on human sexuality. Hefner made an immediate association between his soft porn magazine and Kinsey's research. I referred to it in the first introduction to the first issue. I called it the other great book that was coming out in 1953. Max Lerner, uh, the historian and, and a good friend of mine, said that uh, Kinsey was the researcher and I was the pamphleteer. And uh, it's an interesting way of looking at it. I certainly do think that in a very real way the sexual revolution began in 1953, you know, with the second book and the beginning of Playboy. Hugh Hefner had been under the influence of Kinseyan philosophy since the release of the male volume in 1948. He had even written about it in a college publication years before he started Playboy magazine. Half a century later, in Playboy's 50th anniversary issue, Hefner paid special tribute to Alfred Kinsey, celebrating the man who had helped him launched the sexual revolution. But Playboy represented more than just nude photos of the girl next door. According to Hefner, the magazine was, quote, a statement of rebellion without question. The first official Playboy Playmate was named Janet Pilgrim, directly intended to mock America's Puritan heritage. In time, Hefner would publish the Playboy philosophy, a new morality for the post-Kinsey era. Just as Kinsey had gone all over the country preaching the message of sexual reform, Hefner followed his example, giving speeches, appearing on talk shows, and speaking in public forums as the pamphleteer for Kinsey's sexual revolution. So what you're saying, Mr. Hefner, is that, is that we should encourage premarital sexual relations? I think that we should encourage the notion that uh, sex can be uh, right and proper in marriage or out of marriage. In time, Hefner set up the Playboy Foundation, which became, quote, one of the major sources of income for the Kinsey Institute. But was Hefner's sexual revolution simply about giving consenting adults the right to alternative lifestyles? Or was there a hidden agenda within the pages of Playboy, one that would further the child sexual abuse also found in the Kinsey reports? In 1983, Dr. Judith Reisman was appointed by the Juvenile Division of the Department of Justice to investigate the images in Playboy, along with Penthouse and Hustler magazines. The reason for the study was due to the rise of violent sex crimes committed by young adults against even younger children. Those who were committing these crimes were often found to have copies of Playboy and Penthouse magazines in their possession. But what could be in these magazines, often thought to be harmless, that would compel young teenage boys to commit violent sex crimes against other children? Dr. Reisman had done a radio interview with Pat Buchanan about her research into Kinsey and the soft porn industry. Soon after, she was contacted by the Department of Justice as part of a joint effort with the FBI. I got a call from the Department of Justice when they heard me on, on, um, on uh, the Buchanan program, and I was saying, you're, you're going to have to have an increase in, in sexual crimes by children against children and by adults against children. You cannot do the kind of of programming of people's brains, minds, memories, and bodies. The connection between the brain goes all the way down from the retina all the way down the, the central nervous system and into the genitals. You, you can't show people those kinds of pictures 
and, and arouse them in that way and not think that they're going to act out either positively on somebody who agrees or negatively on somebody who doesn't agree. Uh, that's what's going to happen. And you can't, you just simply can't do that to billions of people at one time, uh, you know, to masses of a population. In her Department of Justice study, Dr. Reisman revealed that from 1953 to 1982, Playboy and eventually Penthouse and Hustler magazines had published approximately 9,000 images of children involved in sexual scenarios, an average of about eight to nine images per issue. And, and I showed the development of the child in those, in those images, from, in cartoons, in photographs, and the use of the child as a sexual object by the observer, by the viewer. And I said, you know, your average guy thinks he's buying a girly magazine, you know, a magazine that's just pictures of pretty girls. And he has no idea that his, the messages that are being pumped into him, neurophysiologically, if you will, all, you know, all the way down and through his system, include images of, of sexual assault of children. And he, as the viewer, uh, becomes the predator. That's just the way the human brain works. The following are images from Dr. Reisman's presentation at the FBI Training Center in Quantico. Please understand the most severe images we are unable to show you. Dr. Reisman demonstrates how the cartoon imagery of children progressed into real-life images, either of children or of legal-aged women who were made to look like obviously underage girls. Over time, the scenarios suggested greater degrees of sexual aggression and violence, including murder. Um, that cartoon says, can you read it? Well, anyway, it says, uh, thank you, um, good night, Betty Lou, thanks for a really swell evening. Now here, we do see the penis. One of the few cartoons that we have, the male penis. Of course, it appears that the gentleman has murdered Betty Lou. She's tied up in one of these uh, leaf bags. Now, I will challenge any of you in the next week or two weeks or month or two months or three months to drive along a road and see a garbage bin tied up like that, a leaf bag tied up like that, and not somehow to flash back to this kind of fantasy image. Now, for you, it may not be a problem, but we have reason to suspect that for some publics, that kind of continual flashback in our subconscious constitutes a real problem. Dr. Reisman believes that millions of American men have been conditioned for decades by such imagery often struggling with an addiction that they don't understand and cannot escape. The addiction to porn has now been handed down to America's children, giving their young minds a perverse view of reality and of the relationships between men and women. With mainstream soft porn magazines having normalized the idea of sex and violence against children, could this be, as Dr. Reisman has taught, the reason for the continued rise of child abductions, child molestation, and even child murder in our country? And are these materials, which are often defended under the First Amendment, the real liberty that America's founding fathers fought and died for? I recently read on, uh, I think, Fox News, you know, um, one of, the, one of the, the newscasters there has got a blurb or an article right now on the Internet, uh, you know, are our children safe? Is this ever going to end? And, and I know for a fact it will not end. And it is only going to get worse unless something is done about pornography. The most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence and, and sexual violence. Because the wedding of those two forces, as, as I am know only too well, brings about behavior that is just, uh, mm. is just uh, 
too terrible to describe. After seeing her presentation at their training center at Quantico, the FBI ordered all copies of Playboy and Penthouse magazines to be removed from the FBI post-exchange. A similar reaction occurred with the Southland 7-Eleven Corporation, which had been a major distributor of Playboy and Penthouse. But in 1986, after seeing Dr. Reisman's presentation, the 7-Eleven chain refused to carry the publications, costing the soft porn giants untold millions in annual revenue. Dr. Reisman herself describes what the FBI and 7-Eleven were really responding to. Uh, that what they were getting in their house, what their sons were seeing, what the uncles were seeing, what the boyfriends were seeing, was how to sexually abuse a child and laugh about it. During World War II, the Nazis used cartoons to condition the minds of Germans against the Jewish people, creating an exaggerated and comical identity that ultimately led to their persecution and mass murder. Dr. Reisman believes a similar kind of conditioning has happened through the use of cartoon imagery that depict the rape and abuse of children. Children are being sexually assaulted, uh, they're being, they're being uh, trampled on, they're being kidnapped, they're being murdered. And I have all of those kinds of cartoons. Some of the following cartoons are disturbing, such as this image from Playboy of an infant child masturbating with a title that reads, Getting Off. Not surprisingly, the cartoon supports the Kinseyan view that children are sexual from birth. Children are often shown to be the aggressors, as in this image of a small child speaking to an older man with a candy cane. The caption reads, No thank you, nice man. I don't want to go for a ride in your car. Why don't we just go up to my place and B-A-L-L? -L. This image from Penthouse has three young girls in conversation. The one with the candy cane says, Yeah, and he gives you one of these just for straight sex, no deviations. This Playboy image is of a young girl putting her dress back on. She says to the older man in the bathrobe, you call that being molested? In this scene, a young girl is in bed with an older man. On the phone she says, hello mommy, I met this nice political leader from the moral majority on Capitol Hill. Incest is another prominent theme of the magazines. This Playboy image shows a young girl in bed with an obviously older man. The caption reads, Everything's fine, Mama. Uncle William and I are playing a game called Consequences. This cartoon from Hustler magazine is of a father molesting his high school daughter. She says, Daddy, not only is what you're doing illegal, it's being done badly. Many scenarios involve characters that most children recognize such as Santa Claus and the Wizard of Oz characters, in which Dorothy is either raped or molested by her companions. In this cartoon, the Santa Claus has an ecstatic look on his face because the little girl sitting on his lap has her hand inside his pants. In this one, the Santa Claus has his pants around his ankles as he rapes an obviously frightened little girl on his lap. The Santa images become especially violent, even bloody, such as this one, where the Santa character has just murdered a child with a machine gun. The child's bloody body lies on the floor. The caption reads, that'll teach you to be a good boy. There are literally thousands of such cartoons, cataloged and analyzed by Dr. Reisman. These images have been published by the soft porn industry for more than half a century. But by far the most disturbing collection comes from Larry Flint's Hustler magazine. For years, Hustler published the cartoon Chester the Molester. It's part of a series in which this man was attacking children. The classic Chester cartoon is this one, where Chester sits naked in a chair with three young girls who have obviously been kidnapped, bound, and raped. The caption coming from the TV reads, It is 11 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Dr. Reisman believes that because of suggestive imagery like this, many parents don't know where their children are. 
Sadly, some of them will never see their children again. Chester the Molester was the invention of Hustler's head cartoonist, Dwayne Tinsley, shown here in the 1985 documentary, Rated X, where he explains the character of Chester. And Chester's the character that I do for the magazine. Um, you have a sturdy old guy that would uh, do anything to trap a young girl. When you say young girl, how young do you mean? Well, at that particular time, he was after the younger ones, 10, 12. Uh, his idea is that he wants to get all little girls. Look again carefully at this disturbing image, where Chester is writing information on a notepad, almost as if he were recording data like one of Kinsey's pedophiles. First of all, if he's going to trap a little girl, you know, the idea for him would be to, to knock her out or something. I don't know. I mean, he didn't have to uh, uh, actually use a club or a bat. He could have smacked her. But just the idea of, uh, of the bat is a little goofier. Uh, what better than a baseball bat? I mean, it was just always with him. He was going to uh, hit the little girl over the head with a trap or hit the little girl with his club and drag her off to his lair, as it were. Whether she was going to have fun or not, it was never established. This same attitude seems to have carried into Tinsley's own life. Four years after appearing in this documentary, Tinsley's daughter would testify in court that she had been repeatedly raped by Tinsley himself. In 1989, Dwayne Tinsley was tried and convicted as a child rapist, in part because of the research on his work done by Dr. Reisman. There's just no question at all that those cartoons that we showed, that they showed the, the jury were absolute evidence of the crimes he had committed on his daughter as testified by his daughter. During the trial, the jury was shown one of Tinsley's cartoons, which depicted a father molesting his teenage daughter. The caption reads, Gee, I'd love to go to the drive-in, Tommy, but my dad has some, uh, extra household chores for me tonight. In court, Tinsley's daughter claimed that her father showed her this cartoon and said to her, this is you and me. The Associated Press reported that Tinsley often said, you can't write this stuff all the time if you don't experience it. There's no normal human being that can draw those things that can put that kind of idea out there to the public who is not experiencing that themselves. No, it's just not going to happen. But Tinsley was not alone. His employer, Larry Flint, was also accused by his daughter, Tanya Flint Vega, in her book, Hustled, in which she claimed that her father used the Chester the Molester cartoons to introduce her to the idea of sex and then raped her when she was only nine years old. Like many pedophiles, Larry Flint was never charged with a crime and openly denied his daughter's allegations. Even Hugh Hefner is said to have been guilty of statutory rape. According to biographer Russell Miller in his book, Bunny, The Real Story of Playboy, Hefner himself enjoyed making love to a schoolgirl who had attended his daughter's Sweet 16 birthday party. Miller's evidence was based on the testimony of the staff that worked in the Playboy mansion at the time. As with Larry Flint, Hefner was never charged with a crime. A major breakthrough for Hefner's Playboy magazine and child pornographers in general was the film Pretty Baby, starring Brooke Shields, a film briefly remembered during the recent controversy over the images of 15-year-old Miley Cyrus. Pretty Baby was the story of a 12-year-old girl who grows up with a prostitute mother and ends up losing her virginity in a whorehouse. People magazine ran a story saying Brooke Shields 12 stirs a furor over child porn in films. Playboy featured images from the film along with an interview with the film's director Louis Mal. In the interview Mal said when Playboy requested a photo that would express my personal vision of eroticism I sent a shot of my two-year-old daughter Justine naked. 
This led to the photos above of Brooke Shields, whom I cast in the title role of my new film, Pretty Baby. As early as 1971, Reader's Digest published an article titled, What Sex Offenders Say About Pornography. The article cited the FBI's Uniform Crime Reports, stating that between 1960 and 1969, the number of forcible rapes committed by males under 18 had increased by 86 percent. It could be concluded that some force impelling toward sex crime has been operating on younger males in the United States. The period described by the FBI was one in which Playboy magazine had been the principal form of widespread pornography in America, especially the kind that would find its way into the hands of underage males.